Hello, and welcome all of you um, to Isaac Canada's first of many, I hope, um, talking AACA webinar series. We are delighted that you're here um, and the whole, oops, Franklin, can you, I can't move the slide forward. <laughs> um, we're delighted that you're here. And what well, the point of this um, Canadian uh, webinar series is that we really know that there's lots to celebrate and share uh, in the Canadian world about what we're doing across Canada and AAC and that what we want to do with launching this series is um, encourage those of you and us who are doing great work with um, supporting AAC people who use augmented and alternative communication and even and most especially those of you who use AAC to share your experience and your expertise with us. Um, next slide please. So um, it's important a little bit of logistics um, the microphone is muted for all of you attendees. If you have a question, and I bet you will in this dynamic presentation that we're going to get tonight, um, please um, type them in the webinar question box. Um, myself and Franklin will be monitoring that. Oh, and I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Kathy Howery, and I'm really pleased to be here to support this this evening. Um, there will be a uh, PDF of the presentations, and again, if you go to your taskbar, you can see where you can get the handout and for those of you who want to watch this again or tell your friends um, there will be an archive version of the webinar this evening next slide please so for the inaugural launch of um, the Isaac Canada webinar series I am thrilled and pleased to announce our uh, and to introduce um, Sean Pearson who is going to talk to us about thinking inside the box especially during this time of COVID and the fact that um, we are all doing things differently it's really important to have some fun while we support our uh, folks who need AAC and hopefully that those folks who are using AAC um, will engage in some games and some fun so um, Sean I will hand it over to you and I know that all of you are going to be completely um, um, enthralled with the amount of presentation that Sean is going to give about gaming and the fun that he's going to share with us tonight. So I will see you at the outside. Again, I'll be monitoring the questions, so please make sure that you ask them, but we'll ask at the end. Okay, Sean, take it away. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, I really appreciate it, and thanks for everyone. Uh, for joining, and a special thank you to Isaac and Isaac Canada and this Talking, a a Talking AACA webinar series. I'm so looking forward to this presentation and to everything that's coming up from Isaac Canada. And I will do my best to insert as many A's in this presentation and maybe some booths as well as we move forward. Uh, so, um, oh yes, we have a special freebie uh, coming up for everyone at the end we franklin is going to engage in some randomized gaming so everyone who is here will have the opportunity to win a one-year subscription to lesson picks and this will be done at the end of our webinar and uh, you will see a number of awesome lesson picks uh things as we go through this presentation so yeah so please make use of this and let us know uh, if you do win how you've used lesson picks so as kathy said my name is sean pearson uh for those of you who don't look at that picture of me oh my gosh i look for those of you who know me i look completely different oh my goodness okay yes my name is sean pearson i am a speech language pathologist uh, i am a assistive technology slash aac specialist and most importantly to this presentation, I am a lover of all things cardboard, wood, 
and plastic. And yes, as Franklin said, everyone um, in order to win needs to remain here throughout the webinar and be here at the end. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Sean underscore SLP, and you can email me at accessible SLP at gmail.com. I am always happy to discuss anything via social media or via email related to AAC, gaming, uh, anything you want. I'm happy to talk. So some disclosures, um, I have no relevant financial disclosures to mention to this. Uh, um, however, I do have some non-financial disclosures I'd like to make. Some of the products I might be showing in this webinar may have been received from uh, publishers or companies. Um, however, I think I might have actually taken most of those out as I was going through, but uh, just be aware of that. So what is my gaming credit? Uh, why am I here? Why am I here to talk to you guys about AAC and gaming? Um, because there are a lot of amazing, including Kathy who introduced me, there are a lot of amazing people in the AAC field uh, who could come and talk to you about uh, working with complex communicators and AAC users. But I think I have some special cred that I think lends me to talking about uh, using gaming with AAC users. So I've run a board game club in a school that I worked out of for the last two years. Uh, when we started, we had four students and now we regularly get over 30, which I am so proud of and it's an amazing way to spend, to spend lunch time with the students. Uh, we have a number of AAC users who actually come to game club, which is terrific. Um, I co-host a podcast called All the Bits, All the Bits Board Game Podcast. It's a very family-friendly show where we talk about gaming, we talk about our children, I talk a lot about education and using games for education as well. And I'm, I'm currently working on an RPG, a role-playing game specifically for AAC users, and we'll discuss that a little bit more as we go on. So what are our learning objectives here today? Uh, number one, we'll identify at least three different ways we can use board gaming to support the development of language and language in general and complex communicators. Uh, learning objective two is we'll describe how to use role-playing games, and from here on in, I'll, I'll, I'll use the term RPG, and story-based games to stimulate language and complex communicators. And we'll identify at least two online resources to access print and play or digitally adapted games for your own use with uh, either for yourself or with students or children uh, who are AC users. So I just wanna show you guys uh, some new friends you might not be familiar with. I think everyone is probably familiar with, again, lesson picks, as well as this Apple uh, logo here, which is teacher pay teachers. One thing that we will be addressing a lot uh, throughout this presentation, and um, I just noticed that it's a PDF, not a PowerPoint being posted. So I'm going to send Franklin a, uh, another file with the links because I have everything has a link in this presentation and all the games I am linking to the Board Game Geek website. So I'm going to make sure I put that uh, in another document for you guys to download. But Board Game Geek is the internet, basically the biggest the biggest database on the internet for anything gaming related. So you can find um, profiles for all the games I'm gonna be talking about and thousands of other games that you can think of. Um, there's a website called Print and PNP Arcade, Print and Play Arcade, where it's a place you can download a bunch of games for free, as well as ones that you pay for. You download the PDFs, print them off, um, and you're good to go. And then the last one that you might not be familiar with, that I'll have a link to, is called Drive Through RPG. Similar to Print and Play Arcade, this is a place to go to get RPGs that you can download and print off. So before we get into the main meat of the presentation, I do want to discuss some accessibility concerns. And I just want to let you guys know that these are things that have come up in my practice and when I've been using games, and there totally could be more, and I will acknowledge that. But these are two things that have come up with me and that I've had to um, deal with from an accessibility point of view, and that's the holding of cards as well as the rolling of dice. So the first thing for the holding of cards I want to show you guys are some resources for card holders. And I have three different levels here, basically. I have kind of your Etsy card, card holders in the middle here. These are customized card holders that you go on Etsy and they're usually engraved with your name on them. They're super fancy. They're a little bit more expensive, obviously, because um, they're from Etsy. Um, there are the Geek Up card and bit holders. These are about $5. 
So each, they're silicon, they're durable, they come in a variety of different colors, and they have space for your bits on there, which is really, really nice. And then there's the do-it-yourself paper-made ones. Um, I have a link here for one that's basically just a piece of paper that's been folded in the right ways, and you can stand your cards up on it. This is the one I have used um, at my schools when, I, when I've been playing games with people, um, but you can do them I, I was once at a talk and they made ones out of two pencils and two zip ties on either side of the pencils. And that's how they made it. And then you put the cards in the middle. That's how they made it. So there are a variety of different ways, but I have one linked here. The other, the other thing I want to talk about are dice. And I have two things because again, we are in COVID and we're, we're doing a lot of digital stuff. So digital dice has become actually a big thing, which is awesome, which is terrific. The one I have linked here is one that you use specifically in PowerPoint. And all it really is, is a looping video. So a lot of people didn't think you could do something like this in PowerPoint before, um, but what it is, it's just a video. And I've used, again, I've used some Unity images from Lesson Picks here, and I, you can just, I can turn over my screen and you can click it and boom, and you click it when you want it to stop. So it's like you're rolling a die. Um, that's for this one. So imagine thinking for AAC, you put your different your different visuals in here, your different, um, for whatever robust communication system you're using, and you could use this as a way to practice. The other one I want to show you, this is what's on that link that I have in the PowerPoint. Um, they've created a whole bunch of different ones, like just regular die, like these. There, oh, I should stop it. There are one with words. There's ones with symbols, which is really cool. And remember that, keep that in mind for later. And then ones with words. So a whole bunch of cool stuff. I know, I think um, I think Lesson Picks, you can roll die now. I recently saw this uh, app that, that, that I think from Israel, from someone in Israel that I think you can roll dice. So there are a whole bunch of different ways to do it. Uh, Chrome is another really cool way to, to roll dice. And there are tons of Chrome extensions that let you roll different kinds of dice. Um, I just listed three here. Um, and the one I use is really good dice. That's a really cool one because it lives in your Chrome, in your in your extension bar, you press it and it rolls the dice on the, the die on the screen. It's just a D6. Dice thrower is another one. And tiny D20 is if you want to do something more, if you want like a 20 sided die or different sided dice, um, that's another good one that you can use as well. Um, and then there are different kinds of dice for different kinds of folks. And this is probably what I've used, uh, I use when I see my kids in person, um, whether it be chunky dice, whether it be uh, medium sized dice, whether it be giant inflatable dice that you have to put on a wheelchair and push off. Um, or if you need something switch accessible, the good old alternate is a terrific uh, way to roll dice. So there are uh, tons of different dice out there. So um, when we are looking for a gaming experience, what am I looking for? What, what am I looking for in a game that I want to use for language, specifically for AAC, but just in general as well? Uh, I want to make sure it's got that the interactions in the game involve turn-taking. There are games that are called real-time games, and that's they're, they're frantic, and they just kind of things are happening constantly. While those are fun games, and I personally, as a gamer, absolutely adore them, they're not the best for working on uh, working on language, specifically working on AAC, because if you think it, it does take time to compose an AAC message, uh, they don't work the best, um, at least in my opinion. You want opportunity for core, and I personally believe that just about any game you can find anywhere, which I'll show you in a minute, has opportunity for a vast amount of core language in it. Uh, you want to model at an appropriate level, so you want to, whether you're working with a, a, a single word user, whether you're working with uh, someone at the phrase level, you always want to be uh, modeling at the level they're at or slightly above so you can scaffold them. You want to limit questions. You want your, those questions to be open-ended. Again, this is, this is, I'm sure the people here, this is all preaching to the choir. Uh, you want to encourage commenting and narratives. You know, so much, so much that happens in a gaming experience can be unexpected. So you really want to encourage the people, the users that you're working with, the people that you're working with, or, or your children, you or yourself, you want to be talking about what's happening in the game uh, and relating it to personal experience whenever you, whenever you can. You want the person to walk away from the game that you just played thinking, oh, I want to go back and play it. I want to play that game again. Um, 
always use lots of different words, uh, different function functions, uh, verbs, descriptors, nouns, anything you can think of. We don't want it to just be requesting. And as I'll come back to so much about this, this webinar, you want it to be an experience, right? The same way we want to make something like shared reading an experience, we want to make gaming an experience. And this is coming from a hardcore gamer, obviously, but I do believe that. Uh, so I have kind of narrowed this down, and I think you can actually expand it here, that I truly believe just about any game, and I went through my very vast collection, and, um, which I hope my wife isn't listening, but that's well over 300 games, <laughs> counting my own games and the games that I use with my, um, with my students and people I work with. But I believe just about any game you play, you can use Watson, you can use I, you, go, like, no turn more and i'm sure you could find all sorts of other core words no matter what robust communication system that you can use right and once you've signal signaled out those core words man you, you can just go from there if you have a phrase-based user if you have someone who can who's an uh, ac user and engaging in conversation i think we all know all the things you could say with a robust communication system but even for your your emerging communicators and your comp complex communicators who are just starting out, all these words can be a possibility when you are gaming. And th that's what's so important about gaming to me. So in addition to that, in addition to, to um, you know, can you do core with gaming, which is A, the number one question I get. And the number two question I get the most is, what about rules? And here you can see my lovely daughter playing some games that are totally not age appropriate for her, but that's okay. Um, you don't necessarily want to worry about rules. Um, you don't have to worry about rules. The, the cool thing about games, especially hobby games that we're talking about, but even your, your old school classics like uh, Mousetrap or uh, Guess Who or any of those games, they are so incredibly tactile. There's a tactile and sensory nature to games that they really do lend to that experience. So you can see up here in the first picture, my daughter's playing a game by a, a friend of mine, Dan, and his wife, Connie, called Chai, which is an absolute gorgeous game. It's one, one of the most gorgeous games I've ever seen. Um, you're making tea, serving tea, um, but it, it's obviously not for a three-year-old. It's not a game for a three-year-old here, but she has turned it using these chunky bits, the tea ingredient, she's turned it into a sorting activity, and she's using these teacups and putting putting all the, the pieces there. She's putting them in. She's... Uh, lifting them up so she's putting one after another more doing all sorts of things with these pieces and this having a great time with it and this bottom quote unquote game down here it's not really a game it's uh, more of a stem uh, material called grab tracks which again not appropriate for a three-year-old you have to basically build um a, a course for a marble to go from one spot to another but she loves just building it she loves when i build it and she watches the marble go the other day she with it and she just created power and the marbles were princesses right but they're these incredible tactile pieces and she absolutely loves it so just think let's say you have this game and you want to play with it with um a student you could just go ahead and play with it and not worry about the rules and just enjoy the the tactile nature of the game all right so now we're going to get on to games we're going to really talk about different games and different products. Um, I will say this, I'm, I'm coming at this from a couple different points of view. One is I want to include stuff in here that I believe uh, will work. Jenga does not work, um, but I don't really use Jenga that much. Will that, that can use in a COVID environment that you can use in where we currently are now with teletherapy. Uh, either games I've used myself or I believe will work. Um, I wanted to include, and I want to include stuff that's easily accessible. There are some games that are just impossible to, to find. So I want to make sure if you guys want to go out and get these games, you would be able to get them. Also keep in mind, I'm coming at this from more of a, a, a beginner to games, someone who's new to games, um, and coming at it more from, I work mostly with children from kind of like that four to 12, 13 year old. So that's kind of where we're looking at in terms of uh, language and what we're using. but. If you have any questions after, we could totally talk about uh, how you could how you could use more advanced games if you want as well. 
So mass market games are your games that you know, that you're familiar with, games like Jenga, games like uh, Candyland, uh, Guess Who, Spot It, uh, this is the Hulk version of Don't Wake Dad, because Hulk is cool and they'd rather have Hulk than, than the dad who pops off. Um, these are games that you're familiar with, that if you're an SLP or an OT or um, anyone who's worked with children before, you either have a bunch of these games in your closet or you've used these games before, you're totally familiar with them. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on there because they're awesome and they work. They still work great. I'm hoping to show you some kind of new stuff that you might not be uh, that familiar with. So this is just, I always include this in when I do a talk about gaming because this is a friend of mine who um, is, uh, doesn't have, has some vision concerns. You know, he's, um, he's in a wheelchair. He does lots of core vocabulary and we took Crocodile Dentist and we created, we were able to adapt Crocodile Dentist so he's able to play. And this is one of my favorite pictures because he loves when that, when the crocodile snaps down on you, he just almost jumps and it's one of the only things that can really get him to move. Uh, but it just goes to show the things you can do with, uh, with games. Uh, one of these mass market games that I feel like a lot of people aren't that familiar with that I do want to focus on really quickly is this I Found It series. And what it is, it's just the, this game board, as you can see on the left, that has a whole bunch of kind of silly scenes. This is a Disney one. And then inside those silly scenes are a bunch of different kinds of vocabulary. You can see in this middle picture, what you're doing is you're flipping over a card and it might have an apple and you have to look here, put the Mickey Mouse ears on everywhere in this picture that has an apple uh, according to a timer. But I love these, I love silly scenes as an SLP regardless because there's so much opportunity for vocabulary, right? Uh, in them, which is great. And this one has all different types of IPs. So there's a Star Wars one, there's a princess one, there's just a regular one, Marvel. Whole bunch of other different things in it and obviously it's called i found it so hey this one i've used a ton for i found it or i've worked i've done i see it i've just done c so you can see i have it circled here again tons of opportunity for it once you start getting into talking about the vocabulary in there too the sky's the limit with what you can do with it which is awesome. And again, that works totally, I, I've done it. I've just used one section of it to use it through a teletherapy where I put my document camera down so they could see it and we've gone through it and done this activity and it's worked great. Uh, I want to point out a couple of things that are available. Um, one, everyone, uh, everyone's familiar probably with Candyland, right? I love Candyland. Some people in our hobby absolutely despise it, but I think it's a great game for working on colors and vocabularies and prepositions and more. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I just want everyone to know that Gail Van Tatenhove, if you're not aware, created this awesome, awesome adaptation of um, Candyland using Unity, Unity cards. There's 36. I have the 36 version, but there's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, and it is amazing. I have the video here. I'll put a link on, on the thing as well as a link to her uh, teacher pay teacher store so you can buy it. I am not going to try and explain it because she's Gail Van Tatenhove and you should watch her video because I can't come close to explaining it like, like she does. But it, it works amazing. I'll just let everyone know that too. The other thing I kind of want to point out to you guys is, oh, sorry, is I uh, guess who? Um, guess who is another terrific game for working on question asking, uh, descriptions, vocabulary, all sorts of great stuff. And the Saltillo website, the Saltillo chat corner, um, I have chart corner here, I apologize, chat corner, um, actually has a smart chart for guess who, which I've used a ton. I've also made my own using unity symbols and uh, Proloco um, pathways as well. Um, so it's very easy to adapt. If you want to make your own, you could just uh, look at it and kind of learn how to do it. Uh, so, if you are an SLP, you guys have probably heard about, you, you've probably used multiple copies until they broke of both Pop-Up Pirate and Caribou. I'm not going to talk to them, talk a ton about them, but kids absolutely adore them and love them and will use them and they will break them. And Caribou is super, super hard to find, as I'm sure you guys know, it's like gold to SLPs if you could find a copy. Uh, but kids just love them and they actually work perfectly in this environment. You know, I, you would be shocked how much how much language you could get by just holding up the barrel from Papa Pirate and just working on put it in, put the sword in, red, red in, um, pop up, not pop up. It didn't pop up. And just holding it up and the kid and the, the students or whoever you're working with just directing you from their side of the screen where to put the swords. And I've gotten like 
hours and hours of use out of it. Same thing with Caribou, works the same way. I put my document camera down on it, uh, my webcam down on it, and they tell me where to put the keys and whether there's a ball and what to do with the ball. And it works great. But what if you're super fancy and you want to have a digital version? Well, there is, courtesy of the um, Simply Speaking SLT, which I have here, she has created these awesome, awesome, awesome PowerPoint versions of these games. And there are two, th she's got three actually. She's got a, a whole bunch of things on her, her, her teacher pay teacher store, but the two main ones I wanna talk about are Caribou and Papa Pirate. And what they are is they are just PowerPoint digital animation implementations of Caribou and Papa Pirate. And you can insert your, your own symbols in there, which I'm going to show you in a second and how cool and how awesome it works. Um, I just have her kind of her, some screenshots of her uh, website so you could see in there the, the, what they look like. And I have a, a copy here of my own um, caribou that I've used a ton. And again, using, uh, using lesson picks, I've just dragged the unity symbols in there and we've targeted these words. I have one where I think we're working on like go stop and, and in, and that's all that's here five times each. And what you do is I'm gonna do, let's have a look here. Hopefully this works so you guys can see what it looks like. I've inserted these in, uh, hopefully this works. There we go. You can add the ball to show you guys. I, you add all the balls in, but then you take the key. You kind of, let's say, okay, want. And then they would find want. Um, the key goes up. There's a ball there. So you practice, you practice whatever word you want to work on. You click the ball. That ball, okay, the ball's in, the ball's in there. And then um, I can't see the one, but then you knock this off. And when you get all six, uh, the um, treasure chest pops open and the kids go crazy for it when the treasure chest pops open. Because again, caribou is just like your best friend. All right, that's it for the mass market game. Now we're gonna go on to hobby games. Uh, these are the games that for the longest time were the harder to find games, um, but I think they're well worth the effort to find. And the reality is I'm um, pretty much, these are kind of what we call gateway games. I have pictures of like Carcassonne and Dominion and Sushi Go and Catan. You probably, even if you're not that familiar with games, you've probably heard about these games. And the reality is these days you can walk into a Walmart um, here in Canada, you can walk into Chapters, Barnes and Nobles, and you can probably find all these games. And I'm pretty sure most of the games I'm gonna talk about here you could walk into these stores and you could totally find them, which is great, which is a great thing for a hobby and a great thing for um, gaming in general and using them with uh, people who use communication devices. So first game I wanna talk about is Concept. And there is a kid's version called Concept Animals. And Concept does this thing where it uses symbols to communicate concepts. Now, this is where if you're not familiar with this game, you would all be looking at me with your jaw wide open and being like, that's familiar, right? Um, that is familiar because that's what we're, we're all doing with our AC devices. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of the, the player board in a second so you could actually see what it looks like. Um, I will say I have, while I've used Concept, the main game, a ton in therapy, I have never used the children's version of it. Um, but I think what it does is it uses animal features to describe animals. And so you'll notice here on, on the board before I get to the next slide of concept, which is the top picture, you have these little cubes, you have a question mark exclamation point, and you're just putting them down on, on, the, on the board to say what you're saying. So let's say, um, let's, say, uh, uh, let's say you're trying to do Superman. So there will be a spot and I hope it's on here. Um, let's say you're trying to do Superman, right? If you look here, you would put a little thing where it says uh, uh, man, male. And then there's one where it says fantasy and my screen's kind of, uh, or not, or fiction. You would put it on there. Um, there might be something like movie. You could put it on movie as well. And you're basically describing a word that's on the card, or you could do like I do and just use your own words. Um, you, you're describing a word using these visuals on here. Hey. That's totally what we do. What we do, and I do a lot of descriptive teaching or descriptive talking with my, with my uh, students, and that's exactly what this is doing. And it's amazing, right? If you look at this board, you could have so many opportunities to practice descriptive 
talking with it. And one thing I've done is I will print off, like I had a kid who was using word power and I printed off the symbol sticks for watch and I put it over here, you'll notice the one that says theater, film, camera, which is like the six down. I put it there and put a whole bunch of other ones and that's how we played the game. And it worked, it worked to a T, it was great. The other game which you might be familiar that I use a lot, especially for descriptive teaching, is uh, code names or code names pictures to be specific. There are two different types. There's one with word and there's pictures. Code name pictures is a game where you give clues in order to tie together uh, pictures on the board uh, with code name pictures and these different uh, character ones you don't need to read. Um, and what I do with them is, again, I will pick out the cards beforehand, lay them out, and then we will use descriptive you know, we'll have to use descriptions to talk about them and descriptive talking. We might be, um, you know, working on uh, buildings or something, right? And they'll have to talk about big, big and small. And they'll have to talk about, um, I might put ones with winter scenes. I might use specific uh, superheroes for hot, like Ghost Rider down here in the Marvel one. So I'll, I will go through it before to do it, but I've also played this game with just a group of um, AAC users who were more, who were, um, who were able to kind of go through it themselves and play the game like you're supposed to play. But it works really well and the kids love like the Disney one, I think there's a Harry Potter one as well. Um, they love them. This is another game, Corkle, which a lot of people are familiar with. Um, it's a simple game about lining up shapes and matching, lining up and matching shapes. But the one thing I want, I want to point everyone to is look at the colors. Look at the contrast on those pieces. Um, I have an OT friend who took a marker and played this game with a student who has um, CVI and colored in to make them just a little bit brighter because some of them need to pop more. And it was such a big hit. It was terrific, right? And again, you could work on tons of things, on tons of core vocabulary with just playing the regular game as well. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, I try to keep this very much like stuff that you can use in teletherapy, via COVID, thing, uh, things like that. These are probably the only two things in my presentation um, today that you might not, that you probably can't use uh, with COVID, but there are, there are the two things that my students that I work with and my clients ask the most for, and I love because they work with a really nice range as well. Um, they are dexterity games, so basically means you're doing something with your hand to play them. That's kind of a general term. Um, the first one up here is ice cool. And what this is, you're flicking penguins in and out of rooms in order to escape this hall monitor. Um, it's got amazing graphics on the board, which is a school, but like an icy school. Um, you have to go in and out. You have to go over, you have to go through doors. Um, you have to find the fish. You have to um, put someone in detention. Like there are all, all kinds of vocabulary that you can use, core vocabulary and up, obviously, um, with this game. And the kids love it, the penguins roll, which is really cool too. The other game down here is called Bugs in the Kitchen. And this is, you turn on this hex bug, which is this little robotic bug that comes with it. And you're rolling dice to determine what type of cutlery, um, I'll fix that, what type of cutlery you have to move. So there's sporks, sporks, there are not sporks, there are forks and uh, spoons and knives, and you roll the dice, whatever comes up, you move that, and you're trying to direct him into the kitchen, which is these little pits here. Um, my favorite story with this game, I was playing this with an AAC user, and he was trying so hard to, to encourage the bug to go into his uh, kitchen. They just kept hammering on go, on uh, Prolocal to go until it just over and over, go, 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 until his device froze up. Because <laughs> he kept going, go, 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 go. And uh, this game, uh, I've gone through like five hex bugs because they just constantly die and they have to get new ones. Um, it's such a big hit. It's, I urge everyone to look it up. You can also, you can pick it up on like Amazon and stuff. So. Um, another type of game that I want to talk about are cooperative games. Um, I like forcing my students that I work with to play cooperative games because kids don't always get along with each other and they get super competitive. And the nice thing about a cooperative game is uh, that you have to work together to win. Uh, there are tons of cooperative games. A cooperative game that a lot of people are familiar with is a Pandemic, which if you have a copy of it, you should probably burn it now because it's too soon to be playing Pandemic given what we're going through. <laughs> but my two favorite games I want to talk about here are uh, number one is a fox. And that's it's a very simple deduction game where you're trying to deduce who the sneaky fox is. Um, you'll notice two things about this game. You're rolling dice and they, you're trying to get a matching three of a kind and it's either knowing who the suspects are, 
or it's um, looking at clues. And the cool thing is you'll notice this red thing in the bottom right corner of the picture. And what you do with that is when you look at clues, you you insert a picture of like an accessory, so like a necklace or an umbrella that the, the fox could have. You put it in and then you pull out the thing and dots have to match up. But the kids love, I've worked on so much core vocabulary with just that thing because they love the putting it in, take out, um, look, to see if the match. So just this mechanical thing about the game is, is incredible. And then Zombie Kids Evolution, which is a simple dice roller, but it adds characters and rules as the game progresses. So the game itself takes maybe five to 10 minutes. Um, but each time you play, you get a sticker, an achievement. As the game progresses, you get, um, you get to open envelopes, you get new characters, new abilities, things like that. So there's like a, it's almost like a video game. And this one is always a huge hit. I'm running like five or six different ones with different groups of kids um, at a given time with it. I have to try and remember where everything is. All right, so I'm going to talk about a couple of things before we get on to RPGs here. Um, Rory Story Cubes, I know a lot of you are familiar with it with them, but what they are is they are these dice that you roll and they have images on them, and you you make up a story related to what's on those images. This is my number one thing when I am uh, new to a student or a client. This is what I do to get a language sample out of them, whether they're an AAC user or not AAC user. Um, and this is always a huge hit. They come in a variety of different types. You can get different uh, intellectual properties like Batman and Doctor Who and Scooby-Doo. There's a big pack that's the Max ones, which I use all the time because they're so big and chunky. They're amazing. This is like my, probably my favorite uh, material that works terrific with AAC um, users too. Um, there's obviously an app for that um, as well. The best part of the app experience for Rory Story Cube is you shake the device to roll the dice. The kids eat that up. They just eat that up as well. Um, and then I just, just want to point you guys to this game called Untold Adventures Awake. This is kind of like the next step up. It uses story cubes, but lets you create your own television series. Um, it's got a bit of a more complicated structure, but when I use this with my students, I often just do a beginning, a middle, and an end. So we start at the beginning, we introduce our characters, the middle is where a problem happens, and the end is where we come up with a solution. And this works, again, terrific, because I compose stories with this where we just use a core vocabulary, and that's it. Uh, Haba Games, this is, if I had to pick one company that I enjoy, um, it's Haba. They are noted by their yellow boxes um, and, and chunky, good quality bits. So here are a number of kind of my favorite games, but I'm going to get into three that I really want to point out to you guys. One is Animal Upon Animal. And this is a stacky game. It's got stacking game. It's got really chunky bits, which is awesome. I love the chunky bits. Um, it's terrific for working on like animal vocabulary and prepositions, right? So if you think of like on, off, under, next to, beside, like you can work on all those small words, which is awesome. And it's so social. The kids are always cheering each other on and like, no, no, yes, you did it. Good job. Like there's so much social language in it. That's what I love about it. Uh, Rhino Hero, this is a building game. Um, that's the one back on this page in the middle here. Think Jenga, but reverse. It's another game that doesn't work that great in this environment. But um, it's it's a really great game. Again, on each uh, wall of the game, so each piece, there are all sorts of things happening. If you look at the, the box here, there's a little cat sticking its head out. Um, again, prepositions, descriptions, things like that. The last game here is on the other end of the spectrum. If you want something with a little more strategy, it's called Karuba. And it's a very, what we call gateway game, introduction to tile placement. Um, so you're taking a tile, you're putting it next to something. Again, man, thinking about that core vocabulary, anything on the main page of something like Unity or any of those systems, you're gonna do lots of that, you know, up, down, um, go, you're creating pathways in this, right? So your figure constantly has to go and move and you put it on so much opportunity for language. Um, here's just an example of animal upon animal, right? This is all the language just from kind of looking at this picture that you can think of, right? Up, down, on, uh, give, um, help, turn, put, and then all the animal off all the animal vocabulary as well, right? So it really hits that balance between core and fringe. And this is probably the game I've used the most. Um, it comes in a whole bunch of different varieties as well. Um, sidewalk games. Sidewalk games, I, 
I want to point out sidewalk games because it's amazing. There are so many people making these awesome sidewalk games on their streets out of chalk. Um, if you look just at this picture I have here, some that people have shared on my social media, just these three pictures, I could do feel and go and play and stop and turn and on and off. Like this is so much fun with just some pieces of sidewalk chalk or paint. Um, I have some great examples from Twitter here. I'll leave you, or from uh, Instagram, I'll leave you guys to, to see on your own because uh, I want to get to the next thing. I really want to get the lesson picks quickly uh, before we talk about the RPGs. Lesson picks, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, it's an online resource for custom materials. Um, it contains, there are thousands of different images, including Unity, Unity images, which is awesome. Hundreds of different board game templates, uh, different templates, including board game templates. Um, you can drag symbols directly into PowerPoint, which is really important, which I'm gonna say is a subscription fee um, of $36 a year, but well worth it. Uh, so. Check this out. Like, this is what I love about Lesson Picks, right? I was able to create this board game for a Unity 36 user of mine. Um, all I did was just move it into PowerPoint, take the PowerPoint. We got our pawns here. And every time we roll, we move our pawn and we go up. And then we have to use the word that we land on. Boom. Awesome, right? I have this little board game that I'm able to use. Same thing with uh, Bingo. I have this Unity Bingo game that I've used with her. And uh, huge, works amazing. It's not just Unity, you can do other stuff. We mentioned Caribou before, right? This is uh, just a, a grid that someone made specifically for Caribou. And you have all the vocabulary related to Caribou. So you print this off, you send it to them, works great. If you're working on, on things like uh, spring vocabulary, right? You do this one where you do the game board and you just tell a sentence about each picture you land on. What happens? What does it mean? Um, so many opportunities for language using these things, right? And here's, here's just a picture of what I've done over teletherapy with this Unity race. I'll, I'll have my uh, PowerPoint in edit mode so we can move the pawns. They're totally movable. We roll our dice. We get six. We move this pawn up six. Um, this control panel is covering up my screen. One, two, three, four, five, six. Put. We have to talk about put and use, uh, say, a phrase involving put. Um, terrific. It works awesome. All right, so where else can you find games? I want to point you out to some other games, and I'll have these in the, the file I send um, Franklin after. But um, Print and Play on Arcade, I mentioned, there's a Board Game Geek wiki that will kind of walk you through if you actually want to create your own pieces, um, which is cool. There's a really good educational games geek list. So this is just like a, a list that a lady has curated that has a whole bunch of different print and play education games. There's a print and play Facebook group, and obviously, Teachers pay teachers. You guys are all familiar with it. There's tons of games and companions on there as well. Uh, so that's my spiel about games. And I could go on and on and on about games, but I had to cut it somewhere. So I cut it there. So I hope you guys got some ideas from that because I want to move on to role play. I get lots of questions about role play and um, I love using RPGs for therapy. Um, it's been one of the things that's been eye-opening to me the last couple of years. Um, now that I've done it and how much it works. And it's not just about D&D, &D, so people are, think role-playing RPGs are just Dungeons and Dragons. It's not, we're not even gonna talk about Dungeons and Dragons here. Uh, here we go. So what are some of the benefits, at least in my opinion, of RPGs? Um, this is just a description, so I'm gonna skip that. But um, it's something where you can participate in an activity, but it's also used you know, uh, in a story, a story-based environment. But if you also kind of think of things like psychotherapy or, or um, you know, different kinds of training, you do lots of uh, role play in it as well. Um, so what are, the, what are the actual benefits of it? Well, they're 100%. You can customize them as much as you want, right? You can do it as big and or it could be as big overarching campaign that lasts forever, or it can be a super small thing that is just about involve, involving you going to a character going to a grocery store, which I'll hopefully have time to come back to a good story that I like. Um, it's an open-ended conversation, right? It's, it, there's, no, there, there's no closing point. You can just have this overarching story that keeps going on if you want. Um, it's scalable. You can do it one-on-one, -on -one, you can do it with four or five people. It's great for giving perspective taking. You're putting yourself into the shoes of another character which is so great for some some people to work on and some of our kids, right? Um, because they don't get that opportunity a ton. And it, there's a level of comfort because of that. Um, to me, it's similar to shared reading. Anyone who likes shared reading, who likes a story, 
will probably enjoy an RPG and you can support it with pictures. I support mine with pictures, with uh, manipulables. You can uh, support it with all these things, which is terrific. Um, it's great for social interactions. We mentioned before, you have a group of three, four people together and it's a social experience, which so many of our complex communicators really never get, which is awesome. The length can be as short or long as you want. I will be honest, I have a, a group of two AEC users and they have no attention span. And um, we do a session once, uh, twice a month for about 10 minutes and we just further on our story. That's all they can do and it works great. And there are tons of options for it. Uh, so here's a little thing. Here's a little uh, thing for you to practice to see what you could do. Think ahead as you're seeing this. Um, straight ahead, a ladder falls down in front of you. Looking up, you see that your friend has finally arrived in his helicopter. All right, so you see this. Um, I've just shown this. I've supported it with some pictures of Batman. Um, a picture of Batman, but I would maybe support it with some other stuff as well. What kind of core vocabulary can you use? Well, you can talk about going up the ladder, Batman coming down, going, helping, fast, going on the ladder, going on the helicopter, going in the helicopter. I like that he's finally come. I need Batman. I need Batman's help, right? So think of all this core vocabulary that you could potentially use um, doing this one little scene. And then you can just keep drawing it out, right? Um, it's almost like creating a picture and then being able to go on using that picture. All right. All righty, all right. So I'm gonna share with you guys some products. Um, this is the one product I have the most experience with. It's called No Thank You Evil. It's very much designed for beginners. It's super easy to use. The guidebook walks you through everything. Like there are stories in there. Um, you can create your own stories, obviously, but there are stories that will walk you through. There's little standees to help. Um, even the character pages are super simple. It stresses cooperation. Um, like I said, this is what I use when I first started doing this with my AC users. I read directly from the book. I adjusted some things just to make sure it would work. I make, made sure the language was sensitive to the users I had. But aside from that, it's amazing. And I know a lot of teachers around the world actually use this. Uh, I'm just gonna show you. This is what, what one of my favorite things. Um, that I have here is that um, I have a group who I did this with just out of their normal vocabulary and I asked them what we could do uh, in order to be able to make this easier for our new our new users who were new to this game and we came up with this using a template on board power um, and my my AC users came up with this and uh, it's been such a big hit I'm just getting the we have five more minutes thing here so we're gonna be we are winding down this is the last little bit in our spiel here you guys um but yeah this is really cool and i'm happy to share this like if anyone wants this and wants a copy of this i will gladly share it with you uh go here here just here's just some pictures of our no thank various no thank you evil campaigns that i've done they're not the greatest pictures i apologize um but i want you guys to think how can you use an rpg um in order to uh, help the language of your communicators. Again, for me, it creates an experience for them um, and I can work on specific targets, right? Like that Batman thing. If I, if, if I want to do it where they're going flying different helicopters or different planes, right? I could do lots of fast and slow and in and out and up and up you know, high if I wanted to and where, where are we going? I could focus on that specific language, which is awesome. Uh, I also want to share with you guys really quickly, and this is one of the things I absolutely love. Um, a, a daughter's, I have to get this right, uh, the daughter of a, a good friend of mine created these awesome visuals. Her name's Mackenzie. Um, you can use these if you ever wanted to. Um, I wanted accessible characters for my AAC users to use in, in our role plays. Um, and she created these, and these have been such a big hit, and the, the users absolutely love them. I have ones who printed them off and put them on the back of their devices. Um, I've spoken to a teacher who had a t-shirt made. Um, if you want to use them, send me a shout, send Mackenzie a shout and tell her Sean sent you, just give her a follow, but they're amazing. Um, so I have a few more a few more things here. They're gonna be in the slideshow. I'm just gonna kind of skip through them because I want to get in case we have questions. Um, Argyle and Crew is another one here, some other, different types of RPGs um, that I have here. Here are other RPG options that, that work well with kids. But I, right here, this is my last slide here, um, 
is this this light bulb, right? And this is just if you want to do an RPG, create your own. My favorite example is I have a friend who um, could not go to a grocery store without being a significant problem, and one of his goals was being able to go with his family to a grocery store. So we created an RPG where the character, um, Mr. T, uh, uh, had to go to the grocery store with his friends to create to get the secret ingredients for uh, his mom's famous spaghetti sauce. And that's all it was. And when we got into the grocery store, we had to talk about what would we ask the manager? What would we do with the cashier, right? Pay money. Um, if we got scared, if there was a loud noise, what could we do? And we did this and we use our AAC device to be able to communicate these things about Mr. T. And I will proudly say that this that was a big help in getting the student to finally go to the grocery store. Um, so you can create, and this was just a two paragraph thing that I put together and everything else was open ending. So you can create all these amazing things um, if you want to do an RPG with your students. Um, and I think you guys, okay, I think those things will be there. I think that is the end, as I mentioned. You can hit me up on email if you want to talk about anything um, at accessibleslp at gmail.com or Twitter, Sean underscore SLP. I need to get my Instagram finally going. I will. But that is it, y'all. That is it. Whoa, my friend. I um, feel like I've been doused in gaming and fabulous things and you might even convince me at, who's not a gamer at all to try and do some of these things that was uh, and it was um an incredible amount of information so I'm and it will all be there kathy and the pdf and i will i'm going to send franklin a, another document with all the links to everything as well beautiful so um a couple of things. One, uh, not in the in this um, um, link, but in uh, my personal um, email, I got a, a message from a, a mom who says, "Oh, thank you for making some stuff that we can do that's fun." And mm -hmm. I think that that's the real key here is that um, I always worry that we're going to just think about AAC as something that we have to do or um, is, is you know, work. So I think you gave an amazing number of um, resources to make it fun. And you might even, as I say, you might even convince me that maybe I'll try gaming. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. It would be awesome. It'd be, it'd be phenomenal, actually. <laughs> ask my family. Um, <laughs> If you had to pick a place for people who are like me going, mm, I don't know, um, do you have a place to start? Like, what, what, how do you enter in? For, 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 uh, for games, you mean, just in general? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just see, see what interests you, right? Like, I, I always tell people just Google, you know, Google, Google games. I Google so much because there's so many awesome people out there, games for education, um, games games for communication, you know, things like that. Um, if you really wanna know, you can listen to all the bits of my podcast. Again, we all, all uh, <laughs> often talk about games for kids. If you wanna know more for adults, more for yourself, you can hit me up. Uh, if you go on YouTube, and look at something called the Dice Tower, which is a really popular uh, YouTube channel. You can find all sorts of stuff on there as well. Awesome. So I'm hearing lots of people say thank you. I'm also just wondering um, whether other folks out there like me, I mean, I, I do remember um, doing, um, you know, the who are you game. I don't think that's the right one with kids, but I, I am doing lots of stuff with the alternate spinner. But I, I do think that it's really um, important for us to think about the power of this and the and the language. So, um, what do you think, Sean? That has been the most, and you probably said this. But I'm going to have you do it as a recap. Has been the most powerful thing that you've learned from doing the gaming with the, with whoever the kids, yeah, adults. What what what's been the most powerful impact that you've had? 
I think it's just the experience, as I mentioned before, the experiences that, that I feel like gaming, both RPGs and board games and different kinds of social games that they create uh, with you with you and, and the people you're doing it with, right? You're creating this fun environment where you can just have people, you know, you could just, um, you could forget about everything going on. And, and what's awesome about most games too, especially with AEC users, it kind of puts everyone at the same, on, on the same level, right? Because you're all using, there's not a ton of hardcore language that you need for most games. Sure there are, but um, you know, there are some, but they create this, this environment where everyone can be at the same level and everyone can have this amazing experience. And seeing it firsthand, uh, that's, that's kind of been for me, like I see how much some of my users just have gone towards games and now absolutely love games. And that just, I'm smiling right now. I'm beaming just talking to you about it, right? So um, nice. like, that's the nice. experience. Well, and that's interesting to me because for me, a lot of my research has been on, you know, what's the experience of using a, an AAC mm -hmm. system. And when you are in, it sounds to me, when you're in this gaming modality, especially when you're in the virtual gaming modality, mm -hmm. uh, we're all behind a screen. And once we're all behind a screen, there's all kinds of things that kind of equalize. So that, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. I, uh, I may go further with this, my friend. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very good, very good, very good. All right, um, so I'm gonna leave it open. I've seen lots of people, um, Oh, hang on a minute. There's a question. Is there much opportunity for socializing in the gaming world? Is a question that I heard. Or that... Uh, yeah. So definitely, like I said, I think I think for games, um, when you're doing games with kids, it's all about socializing or adults too. Obviously, that's why I play games myself is because I like to socialize, right? I, uh, it's it's been hard on me this be during COVID because I can't game. So I game with some friends, and sure there are people here who I game with uh, digitally that we we play board games digitally. Um, so and, and and that's part of it. Like so many of our AAC kids, especially I work with a lot a lot of kiddos with autism, right? They don't get those opportunities as, as much. And if I can get a game, especially a highly tactical game, I can get three of them around a game, and we're playing this game, and all of a sudden I've created a social experience for these these students who rarely get that. Perfect. So can you provide a supports for AAC supports for online gaming? And I think you've done a lot of that tonight, but um, do you have a question or do, do you have a mm -hmm. comment for that question? Yeah, if you're if you're doing it, so I, I uh... It's, this is a video game one, um, but like I have a kid who was really into this game called uh, into a fort, Fortnite, which is super popular. And he was playing the Fortnite, and I saw him, and I had up on mine, um, I had my, I shared the screen, I had my iPad up, and I was modeling for him as he was playing it, and I was watching him play, and I just made sure his mom made sure he was watch, looking at some of my modeling throughout. He kept getting shot and getting upset. Um, but uh, yeah, you just you just kind of like you, the same way you would model anything else, you could totally right. do with gaming, right? Right, hundred percent. So your AAC supports are whatever AAC you have. Yeah. So right. Beautiful. I. This is great. I'm gonna. We've got like. Three left so Franklin or whoever will move the slides forward um, I really really want to thank Sean tonight for this amazing presentation and um, thank you for giving us more with the highlights and the links and things as you go forward and I am really um, excited to say that we're going to do more of these Isaac Canada um, webinars with more people like Sean who have great things to share and more in the Canadian context but of course <laughs> what we do in Canada isn't so very different we just have these great people so please um, stay tuned um, there'll be an announcement probably within a week or two about what our next webinar is going to be and um, next slide which is Franklin and the winner is well thank you um first of all sean you did an amazing amazing job thank you very much for for doing this i can see people were were really engaged so thanks very much and thank you kathy for your work and i want to give a a shout out to the isaac canada organizing team tracy shepherd and tracy hunt and lois turner and glenda watson hyatt thanks 
very much, everyone. Um, we did promise that uh, there was going to be a prize winner, or there is going to be a prize winner. And for those of you out there who know me, you know that I'm a bit of an Excel geek. So uh, in order to make sure that there is no favoritism involved, because a lot of you I do know, um, I decided that uh, we would download from the GoToWebinar system all of the registration data. So we have everyone's name and email address. Um, and as Sean mentioned at the beginning, um, I was going to be using some randomized gaming to select the winner. So what, what we did is uh, we generated random numbers between 1 and 100 for everyone. And we did this 10 times. So each person has 10 numbers next to their name between 1 and 100. We took the sum of that. So we added all those numbers together for each person <laughs> and came up with a total score. And oh, Franklin, you're and, amazing. Yeah, well, hey, you know, we gotta that, we gotta make this fair. So that is literally the geekiest thing in the last hour, Franklin. Congratulations. Thank you. But it, it, I'm not done yet because <laughs> the, the the prize winner is not the person with the highest score. The prize winner is the person who scored close to but did not go over 660 and you may ask why that number that number has uh, is a is a budgeting number that i use quite a bit with uh, with isaac particularly for the conferences so having explained all of that now that everyone is thoroughly confused the person the winner of our special draw prize this evening with a score of 653, and by the way, the person who scored has to be here, and I can guarantee that this person is here, and that winner is Kelly Vesoyan. Congratulations, Woohoo! Kelly. Congratulations. That's awesome fun. That's fantastic. That's amazing. Okay. So I, I think the plan is, correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but I think the plan is we will get Kelly connected with the individual who is going to be providing the prize. Is that correct? That, that's it. Okay. So Kelly, uh, expect to uh, uh, hear from us via email, uh, uh, if not tomorrow, then by early next week. Fabulous. Thank you. And, okay, so and just to all guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank oh. you, everyone. Yes, and just as a final wrap up, uh, I would love to, uh, you know, we're 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 love to let everyone know that we are continuing to work extremely hard on making uh, Isaac 2020 a reality next year in Cancun between July 31st and August 5th, 2021. Uh, our organizing committee is hard at work and all of the people in Isaac are hard at work to make it a, a great conference. And uh, we're hoping that uh, uh, the pandemic situation will uh, hopefully ease very quickly for everyone. And uh, on behalf of certainly Isaac International, uh, we want to uh, wish everyone good health and stay safe. And please do listen to uh, your uh, local, regional, and national uh, uh, governmental and health authorities. Thanks very much, everyone.